thank you very much for the kind introductions to both of you and to the rector in particular, you know, for the invitation to come here to Brussels, to, to the VU Brussels. Uh, it's, I've been here before in the chemistry department, but it's absolutely wonderful to be here, you know, and to see all of you. And I want to talk a little bit about my adventure in, uh, in chemistry, ultimately, that brought me to Stockholm. And I will show you also some very, uh, very uh, recent things. So, talking about the art of building small, I always get the question, why do we need these molecular motors or molecular machines? And this kind of question was also asked to the Wright brothers more than 100 years ago. You know, these were the guys that were flying for the first time. And people ask, why does mankind need to fly? If God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings, like a bird. Nobody would have predicted that 100 years later we will build in Europe the airbus, you know, and we can carry 400 people, 1,000 kilometers an hour across the ocean, eh? 10,000 miles. We admire the flying bird. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I like the flying bird. It's so marvelous, Mother Nature. But realize that this machine is completely artificial. Three and a half million parts are completely artificial, made by all these different disciplines, all the way from theoretical mathematics to physics to chemistry to engineering, etc. And it does not fly like a bird. Eh? Try to carry 400 people yeah, a thousand kilometers an hour across the ocean with a bird, with a pigeon. It but we should also be modest because a hundred years after the Wright brothers, we cannot build a pigeon. And my biology friends tell me we cannot build a single cell of the pigeon, not even one of the machineries of the cell of the pigeon yet. So realize that there's still some work to do. So. The joy of discovery, when you are at the university's research institutes, it's an adventure in the unknown, the path to the future. And the most important thing, of course, is the question mark. Which questions are we going to ask? That's the most important thing in learning, in education, in research. There are many challenges, challenges for our students, dreams for the people, opportunities for society and our industries for the future. Often we feel that it is serendipity, accidental discoveries that make big breakthroughs. Don't misunderstand. Failures also so sometimes by accident make fantastic discoveries. And often we get completely lost because we might have an idea to go here, but in this beautiful garden of science we often get lost. And then we hit upon questions that we have never thought about. And these are often the most beautiful question marks and come to unexpected results. So, I suppose everybody here has a smartphone. Who has not a smartphone? I see this fellow has a smartphone. Is there other people that have, is there people that have no smartphone? Good. So everybody has a smartphone. So, which fundamental scientific questions and novel insights and discoveries made this that we have now this communication tool? So it was in the late 40s and early 50s of the past century that physics and chemistry worked on transistors, the first transistors, and the first display materials. That makes it possible that we have now displays and that we have a smartphone and a laptop. Then the batteries came, thanks to John Goodenow. Realized this was in the early 80s, 40 years ago, John Goodenow, together with his Japanese colleagues, invented the lithium battery. That's why we can power our smartphone. That's why we have electric cars now. Nobody had realized 70 years ago that we would have smartphones. The word smartphone, of course, did not exist. It took 50 years and it completely changed the world. Yes, I look now at the students. There was a world before the smartphone. When I was a student, there were no smartphones. Of course, it was the combination of all these different disciplines, and I mentioned here engineers, computer scientists, etc., etc., that makes this all possible. And that immediately points to something which is very important nowadays, cooperation, crossing disciplines, etc., etc. So, facing our future, how to reduce CO2 emission, how to recycle our materials, how to fly kerosene, without kerosene, how to feed 10 billion people. There are a few nice questions and challenges for all of us, you know, and to look at fundamental, yeah, fundamental challenges. How can we come to its solutions in the future? And you will be all part of this fantastic 
journey and we have to go far on our current horizon. This is indeed an adventure and it's an adventure into uncertainty, an adventure into unknown territory. Feel like an adventurer. It makes it exciting. It makes life very exciting. And don't be too afraid for a bit of disappointment, yeah? Because you might lose your way sometime. So, where was my horizon? This was my horizon when I was a kid. I grew up on a farm, you know, in uh, the northeastern part of Holland, 800 meters from the German border. And I think when I was a kid, I was already this fascinated by discoveries. I was reading this book about adventurers and discoverers, etc. And uh, so I was asking my parents, you know, who were farmers, I was asking them about the colors of these plants, you know, why this is white and the other one has a different, nice different color. I was asking about how is it possible that from this tiny seed you can grow a sunflower of three meters high, yeah? And so these are my uh, brothers and sisters. I have nine brothers and sisters, I'm the second oldest, and we were very strongly encouraged to study, to learn, etc. And when I went to high school, this was my chemistry and physics teacher, a new world opened for me. Realize in our village, when I was a kid, nobody went ever to the university as far as I know. And I went to high school and then I was by Dr. Opteweg, he was our physics and chemistry teacher and a new world opened for me because I loved to do experiments, etc. And he was such an encouraging person. And uh, then I went to the university, Professor Winberg, he was American, and he challenged me a lot. And uh, this is our university building, by the way, in Groningen. And this is the first molecule I ever made when I studied chemistry. And I came to his office, I was a beginning master student, and I will never forget, I came to his office and I said, I made the molecule, here is the structure. And he said, Ben, nobody ever made this molecule, not even in America. It was an absolutely useless molecule. <laughs> but I was the first that made this molecule. Can you imagine? It's like making your first piece of music. I make your first goal with soccer or with hockey or whatever, you know, or with volleyball. I was delighted, you know, to do that. And so I studied chemistry, but before I continue, I own a lot to my teachers. And if I would ask you, anybody here, everybody here, you know, I'm sure you all can mention one teacher that made the difference yeah, in your life, that encouraged you, that stimulated you, that was inspiring. Good teachers, you know, shape your future. They open the windows to your future. And I want to give credit to our teachers at this stage. So, after my PhD in Groningen in chemistry, I went to industry. I went to uh, the big shell laboratories in Amsterdam, and then I went to the UK to work in bioscience. And this was a six and a half years experience in industry, which was absolutely fascinating, because I learned a lot about multinational companies, how to, to develop something to real life applications, etc., to work in an international team. And I have, during my whole career, worked with companies also in my profession as a chemist, you know, at the universities, to see if we can bring fundamental science also towards uh, future applications. But I decided to go back to the university because I wanted to work on my own research, to work with students, I also like teaching, and to think about my own ideas. And now, uh, fairly recently, my students came with this Twitter, with this, you know. They found a picture, apparently, of me uh, when I just started at the university. This is when I started as a young lecturer, you know, many years ago now. And uh, apparently I mentioned at that time, yeah, the beauty of chemistry is that I can create my own molecular world. And this is what I ever have done since. And then they put another point on the Twitter in 2020, they said, we chemists are lucky you choose academia instead of becoming a rock star. <laughs> now, you know, Apparently I had a bit longer hair than I have now. I cannot play music, yeah? So I made a good choice to become a scientist, I think, and not into music. So, I work on molecules, creating molecules. We do that in the laboratory, chemical synthesis. The, the chemists amongst you, you know, the students who have been engaged in chemistry or whatever, they know how to do that. I developed with my students a passion for molecules and designing my own molecular world. Sometimes because the molecules typically test a new theory, sometimes they are simply beautiful. Yeah, we can discuss later what is a beautiful molecule. 
or because they have specific applications. And I want to show you a little bit of what we are doing and what we have developed. So doing chemical synthesis is a bit like Lego. For those people who have no idea about chemistries, we build with small molecules, we build bigger molecules, and this is a particularly complicated one. This is a really complicated molecule. It leads at least 35 or 40 chemical conversions, chemical steps. This is Taxol, and this is a very important anti-cancer drug, and I'm sure here in the hospital, at your university, the doctors use this to treat breast cancer, you know? But this is a really complicated molecule. So, in the laboratories, we bake molecules. We have a universal language, the language of molecules in the periodic table. It doesn't matter where I go, eh? when I go to China or South Africa or whatever, I don't speak the language, but I can talk about molecules. Everybody understands that this is sugar, yeah, because we have a common language, and this is the periodic table you remember from high school. We have no borders, we go beyond frontiers. And that's very important. Science goes across borders, it goes across frontiers. We have international cooperation, and we, have this, we share this passion for discovery, and this is the same all over the world, and that brings us together. Scientists, scholars have friends everywhere. And I want to remind you that it will change, and you will all experience this. The laboratories of the future might look a bit like this, eh? robotics, artificial intelligence, data processing, etc. Of course, the human factor will be extremely important, but there is a big change going on now in industry, but also in academic laboratories with all these new technologies. And don't forget yeah, on which shoulders we stand. This is Louis Pasteur, and he mentioned already, now 150 years ago or so, science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and it's the torch which illuminates the world. No borders. We talk a lot about borders and fences, especially in politics. Eh? Science goes beyond border and we share knowledge all around the world. So, this is Mendeleev. You might all know Einstein, yeah, and, but this is Mendeleev because he is one of my heroes. He uh, invented the periodic table, you know, the relation between all the atoms. And that tells you about everything you see here eh, in this room, including everything yourself. All the atoms, how things are connected, how everything is made, all the molecules in your body, all the materials based on this handful of molecules. It's amazing, eh? That everything you see is based on these elements. So this is the element of your, um, sorry, the elemental formula of your body. I don't know if you ever thought about it. Hydrogen 375 million, oxygen 132 million, one lonely cobalt. These are the elements of your body. So why is there so much hydrogen and oxygen Lady, can you stand up for a second? You give such a nice speech. Look at this lady, can you turn around? Look at this lady, yeah? 60% water, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That's all the hydrogen oxygen and a handful of other molecules. But she looks really good, eh? <laughs> Sorry, I'm allowed to say that, eh? But it's 60% water. So this is the human body, you know? It's amazing eh, that evolution created your body with all the complexity, etc., based on this handful. Now the question to the students. You all have a smartphone. Are there more distinct elements, you see them here, in your body or in your smartphone? You have 50% chance. Now the reality is that in your smartphone there are more distinct elements. So a smartphone, if you purely look at the complexity of the chemical elements, it's more complex than your human body. Can you imagine? More elements in your smartphone. Some of these elements yeah, are a bit endangered, and we know they are precious metals. We have to recycle our smartphones. Otherwise, we have a problem in the future. So that puts it in the right perspective. So, this is what we are good at. I, I'm a chemist, and I'm very proud that we are called the creating science together with our friends in physics, engineering, material science, you can create the drugs, yeah, the dyes, the cables, the cars, all these, your clothes, yeah, the soaps, all these materials, including all the components of your smartphone. This is what we are really good at. But you see already, I can wave at you, I can speak at you, I can walk. None of this walks or moves by itself, eh? 
But when you look at some living object, like your own body, you can move. And so your motion is crucial to life. And you see it everywhere, in bacteria that swim in your guts, you know, in all these nanomotors in your body that make things transporting in your body, the eye that you can see, that I can see, or you can see me, yeah, the, all these machines and robots in your body, millions and millions and billions of these tiny nanorobots that make it possible that I can walk here, that I can speak, all do these things. So the key question is how to make things moving at the nano scale, at the molecular scale. Then first we have to know what the nano scale is. Nanotechnology started with a quote by Richard Feynman, a very famous chemist, a uh, physics study, in 1959. There's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he meant is not going down to this basement, but what he meant is going smaller and smaller. You have seen this, and this was the first computer built by IBM, I think. It filled this whole room and it could do way less than your smartphone. But we have gone down and down and we are now at the nano size with the chip technology, you know. Top down to bottom up is the key question. And this is where Feynman already challenged us. Start bottom up, not only smaller, but start with small components, atoms and molecules, etc., and build the materials like Mother Nature does. And it took 50 years, and I, then I had the privilege to go to Stockholm to get this magic call with my colleagues, Jean-Pierre Sauvage from Strasbourg and Sir Fraser Stoddard from the US. So, just to put it in perspective once again, one nanometer is one billion of a meter. The cross section, you look, this is one hair, eh? can you see? One of my hairs? The cross section of my hair is 80,000 nanometers. This is huge, yeah? In the perspective of where we work, the, the level of nanotech and the molecules. This size matter, yeah, I'm sure. When you go to Ostend here to the beach and you have this very nice sand, yeah, you drop down there and you feel very comfortable, eh? But when you go after a day, and it has been a bit windy, eh? I'm sure it's windy here, like in Holland, on the beach, you feel this sand everywhere. Eh? When you take a shower, there's always sand there. The tiny particles go everywhere. The, the pebbles that you see in Spain or so, yeah, you don't drop down there eh? because they hurt. Yeah? But it's the same material. Yes, size matters. And of course, you can look at the nanoscale as a matter of size. Yeah? But also a lot of the properties change. So a lot of people work on hard materials, yeah, like these pebbles and so, and, uh, and look at soft materials. And I we particularly look at soft materials. You can, how can you see at the nano scale? Yeah, we can look at molecules with X-ray diffraction, you know, to make an X-ray image, you know, or another way to look at it. But the most important is these new techniques, like you have these scanning probe methods. This is like a, a needle. Ending at the, at the tip is one atom. And you can move over the surface and you can feel and see the atoms. You can even write, look, this is what IBM did. They wrote Nano USA with carbon monoxide on a copper surface. And on the cross section of this hair, I don't want to take a second one, but uh, you know what I mean now. You can write 250 million letters. So a sizable number of books from your library you can write on the cross section of your hair when you can write at the nano scale. This is the potential of nanotechnology. So, there is also an effect of length scale, and I don't want to go into detail, but when you go to a car manufacturing plant, you have an artificial robot that builds these cars. It's absolutely fabulous. I don't know if you have ever been in a car manufacturing plant. It's unbelievable. These robots build a complete car. In your body, we have other robots that build the proteins in your body. This is an effect, it's almost one billion times smaller. This is soft, and this is hard. So in my world, the world of molecular nanotechnology and motion, it's not so much about getting motion, because there's motion everywhere. Molecules look, move like crazy. But it's about controlling motion. And what I want to do is to give you two studies about the two aspects we are working on a lot, that is switches and motors. Let me start with switches, because this is how we started many years ago. You all know what a switch is, eh? You switch on your smartphone, you switch on your laptop, you switch on the light. 0101, zero, one. and we started with the human eye. This is the switch in your eye. It changes structure, this is the retinol, it changes yeah, the protein, the signal goes to the brain, and you can retrieve information, yeah? But what is crucial, look, if I look at this lady here, 
I see you and you see me because of these switches. There are millions of these switches in your eye that make it possible that I see you due to the light. But of course, when they switch only once, I would see you only once and then it would be over. They have to go back, eh? that's a good switch. I forgot to put the arrow, the arrow is there, you know? But you see it goes back as well, eh? So, under the influence of light, you switch at the molecular level and millions of switches together help you to get the information towards the brain, an information process. So what we did is we built artificial switches. This is the natural system in your eye. We built completely artificial switches as we switch back and forth. And we can store information, zeros and ones, for instance, in a piece of plastic. Yeah, we work together with Philips company and Eindhoven on these projects. Or we make uh, transistors, we make, these are tin layers, all these islands are gold, and in, be in between are molecules, and we can switch these molecules and you can do information retrieval and information storage. Completely artificial system. But because I'm here also at the medical faculty, I want to show you also a few examples where we control, where, where we use these switches for medical purposes. And we all know that the cell is an extremely complex uh, entity. Eh? I think one cell, I was always told by my friends from biology, one cell is more complex than the whole city of Brussels or Amsterdam or Paris. When you look at all the components, all the complexity, etc. But what is crucial for the cell is that they have a cell membrane. And uh, in the cell membrane there are pores, channels, that things go in and out. Yeah? So components can go in, components go out when you have to release them. This is normal. And so what we did is, we took together with my colleagues, what we did is we engineered natural proteins that form a pore in a cell membrane. We built in a light switch, you see here a structure of a small molecule, and we can switch with light from this state to this state. Just like in your eye. And we built it using genetic modification exactly on specific positions. And what we can do then, is then when we switch with light, these proteins, they start to assemble and form a hole, a pore in the cell membrane. So we take part from Mother Nature, we engineer it at the nanoscale, we switch it with light, it starts, it, it gets the signal to assemble, it forms a nanopore. And we could drill a hole in a cancer cell and destroy the cancer cell. This is where we stand. This is very recent result we get. This is nano molecular engineering, and maybe in the future, molecular surgery. This is just a long way before you go to the clinic, you realize that, but this is where we, where we stand. We are extremely pleased with it. The other uh, journey, I want, or the other story I want to tell you is about targeted medicine. When you go to a doctor, you want to have a pill that works, eh? you want to have a medicine that does something, otherwise you don't like your doctor anymore. We want something that does not work, but we can switch on with a flash of light. Smart medicine, used to have high precision in therapeutic action. Imagine, you have somewhere an infection here, or a tumor, hopefully not, but, so you have an infection. You have a medicine, and this medicine goes everywhere, eh? But you want to have it not doing things, for instance, when you have an infection with bacteria, you don't want to destroy the bacteria in your guts, because it's extremely important for your body. So switching it on, on the spot, exactly there where it's needed, with a flash of light, precision therapy. Does it work? It's a bit of a dream, eh? Look, we work on bacterial resistance and cancer treatment. We all experience the COVID crisis, yes? But look, the World Health Organization said, one of humanity's ticking time bombs, the lack of new antibiotics because of build of bacterial resistance. If we can do precision antibiotics, that would be a big, big step forward. Switching it on, it switches off, it's not an antibiotic anymore, no resistance buildup. Cancer treatment, we all know the problems with chemotherapy, that you get all these nasty side effects. If you can do high precision activation, that would be made. It works, look. We took Cypro from the clinic, we built in a light switch, what we call an azobenzene, and uh, we can switch it on, we can switch it off. It automatically switches back after three hours, after 24 hours, after one week, that depends on how we engineer the molecules. 
And we hope no resistance build up and control biofilm formation, which is a big issue in the hospitals. Look, this is what my students did. Typically in a lab, you grow bacteria in a Petri disc, eh? This is bacteria. I think several of you have grown bacteria or have grown cells, you know, in a disc. They took a mask and they make a yin-yang figure. And where we irradiate, no bacteria grows. And you know, where we don't irradiate, yeah, the bacteria grow normal. And after 24 hours, it's off and the bacteria grow. The antibacterial effect is gone. And we are now so far that we go into the clinic to do tests, you know, to see if we can make the next step. The other one is with cancer. So you have here an anti-cancer agent. We build also in a light switch. And then we can change yeah, the inhibition effect of this anti-tumor compound. Yeah, this is still far from application. But the principle works. We can use it to switch an anti-tumor compound. And my dream is indeed that in the future, these very tiny tumors that a surgeon cannot easily remove, that you irradiate on the spot, you activate it on the spot, and you get high precision therapy. But there is one serious problem, and I'm sure some students here will ask the question. How do you get light in your body? Because you don't want to use ultraviolet light. Eh? When you go to the beach, you protect yourself eh? against this dangerous light. But red light, look, sorry for this complicated slide, but look, red light here, this is the wavelength of the light. This is what you need, because this is innocent, and it goes straight centimeters deep in your tissue. So, there is a whole number of groups in the world, including ours, that have made all kinds of different switches. Don't look at the chemical structures. But you see, you can go all the way from blue to red, shift the wavelength. This is typically what chemists do. They engineer change molecules so that precisely now we can irradiate yeah, with red light. And we have now the first antibiotics that we can use really in tissue because we can irradiate with innocent red light and it goes very deep. Uh, the beauty of science is also that there is a relation with art. Science and art have both this creativity, yeah, imagination, etc. And uh, these are the fingers of my PhD student who made the first antibiotic switchable with red light. You see the red light goes straight through the finger. This was my student who did that work, and I'm extremely proud. There was a photographer from the United States that came to our lab. He visited several labs yeah, in the world. And uh, he was so excited, he had read this, and he made this, and this was in several art exhibitions in museums. museum. So as a student, you can do beautiful research, but you can also end up in a museum, you know, with your hand. <laughs> now, what is the bio-nano future? To finish this, to conclude this, of course, I talked about photopharmacology, smart medicine, based on nanotechnology. Of course, there are also many people working now on rewiring the brain. That looks a bit scary. We can discuss about that later. And of course, genomics and DNA nanotechnology that was awarded not so long ago, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, these two ladies, they did fantastic work by making these artificial scissors to cut pieces of DNA when you have an inheritable disease and to put in a new piece of DNA, you can repair yeah, at the genomic level and so on. And this is now expanding dramatically. So there are many developments in the field of medicine yeah, based on nanoscience or molecular technologies. And I just give you a glimpse of, of what is possible in the future. It will change the way we do medicine in the future as well, to some large extent. Now I will come to molecular motors. And so a switch is not a motor, eh? Because the switch switches back and forth, but the motor is something that rotates, eh? like the motor in your car. And uh, we all know what motors are, and once again, the fact that I walk here is due to all these motors in my body, eh? in the muscles, etc. What you distinguish, you know, between a rock and, a, and this animal, you know, that walks on the beach, eh? you will immediately see that this is alive, and this has these machines that make it possible that it can move. The most important thing is that it pushes the system out of equilibrium. And being here in Brussels, talking about out of equilibrium phenomena is particularly rewarding, you know, because this is, has a long tradition here and pioneering work in this field. I read sometimes in a magazine or I see on television, be in equilibrium with your life. Uh-oh. Be in balance or be in harmony. That's good, yeah? Okay? But don't be in equilibrium because if you are in equilibrium, biologically, you are dead.
Because these machines push you out of equilibrium all the state, all the time. We are in an out of equilibrium state constantly, thanks to all these billions of molecular machines. And so this is the most beautiful one. You know, in Holland, this is the most beautiful motor. In Holland, we are pr very proud of Max Verstappen. I'm sure you heard about Max Verstappen, eh? Formula One, eh? He is, a, he is a cool guy, you know, he can race pretty well. And he, of course, is very proud because he just won again this weekend, proud of his new motor. But these motors here in your body, this is a side view, this stuff, they are way better, I tell you, than any motor of Max Verstappen in the Formula One. These, there are millions of these motors and they make the fuel in your body, the ATP, the fuel that powers your body. Did you ever realize, I'm sure there are biologists here, they know the answer, did you ever realize what these tiny nanomotors do with your body? I know Belgian food is much better, you know, than the food in Groningen in the north of Holland. But I don't need half my body weight. These motors make half your body weight of food, ATP, every day. Every 24 hours, half your body weight. Can you imagine? These tiny nanomotors? When I heard this the first time, I said, this cannot be true. Half my body weight? Yeah, but it recycles all, most of the components. Now, what is one of the big challenges that we are all facing at our universities, at our industries, in society, is recycling our materials in the future to make a sustainable society. Come on, guys, we are not smart enough. Your body recycles half your body weight every day. This is typically what nature does. We just have to learn it. This is nanotechnology in action. Okay. What about this motor? It rotates, eh? So what were the fundamental scientific questions that we were facing? How to control rotary motion in the nano world and how to control left and right? Of course, you have to power it, eh? There has to go energy in it, eh? Either petrol or electricity in an electric car. But if there's equal probability to go in this direction or in this direction, you stand still, you will get it anywhere. So you have to go either clockwise or counterclockwise. How to do that? We take advantage of chirality, left and right, at the molecular scale. And the most beautiful example, yeah, of course, is your left and right hands, but at the molecular scale, maybe the most beautiful example is the DNA, the right hand the delix in your body. It was called the Mona Lisa of modern science. And so, when we can control the handedness, yeah, we can control direction, and this is what we did. And this is the tiniest motor that has ever built in the world. You see, this is the first molecular motor, powered by light. It's one nanometer, one billion of a meter in size, and you see it spins, eh? it rotates continuously, as long as you put in energy. And the fuel here is light, it's powered by light. And it goes either clockwise, or we can make it counterclockwise. If we have this form, it goes counterclockwise. If we have this form, it goes clockwise. This is how we made the motor. And you see it has four steps, one, two, three, four, and that makes a 360 degree cycle. Powered by light, different chemical steps, and this is how it rotates. And it rotates continuously as long as you give it energy from the light. Now, you might ask, how fast is such a motor? The first motor that we discovered was spinning once an hour. Now, you cannot do much with it, you cannot build a car or whatever, yeah, or make a machine. Now we have motors that rotate at 10 million rotations per second. And we have motors that spin faster, but we don't know how to prove that they still go in one direction. That's the problem, because they are so fast. So we have motors with all different speeds, yeah? Once a day, once an hour, once a millisecond, etc. And then, we are now making tiny machines, and I will show you one recent result. This is synchronized motion. You might wonder what is synchronized motion. Because if you want to make a machine, you have to synchronize motions, eh? Yeah, think about a real machine. And my students were looking at the moon. Now you might think, I don't know how it's here in, in, in the Feu Bay, but uh, are these students in Groningen so romantic, you know, that they uh, go out of the lab and look to the moon all the time? No. But there is something very special about the moon. You know, you always see the man on the moon from the same side. That is so glad, synchronized motion, eh? when the moon goes around the Earth. And you see here, when you look carefully, this part here, which can rotate around that bond, and this one here, this is the motor rotor axle, you see it spins. 
It goes around in one direction. And this part here always sees the same face of this lower part. You see? Like the moon. So now we have synchronized motion. And this is a real breakthrough for us because now we can couple different motions together. And you always, when you stand here, you see this rotating moon always from the same side. And this was a very delicate design, but it works. Now, I will show you a few examples because people ask me, you know, what can you do with these motors? Yeah? Except very fundamental studies that can prove motion. Now, as a, you all know what, a, what the display is now. In this display, usually there are rod-like molecules. Like, they are organized like beams in the river. I didn't, don't know if you ever thought about it. In your smartphone, these molecules are rod-like, and they are all aligned like this. And when you want to make a pixel, a color pixel, yeah, a nice pixel or a nice picture, you have to uh, change your organization. So what happens is they twist, and you get this kind of organization. Yeah? And when this is a helix, this is a small helix, you get a blue color, and when it's a long helix, you know, expands, you get a red color. And what we did is, we took our motor, a tiny amount, we put it in there, we irradiate, and you see within a minute, we can expand, contract, expand, contract, make every pixel, every color in a layer of these materials. Just use light. This was an Eureka moment in my career. What my students did, I will never forget. They took me to the lab and they said, Ben, you have to come to the lab. That was on the quarter past five on a Tuesday afternoon. And they showed me this. They had made a tin film of this material on a glass plate, a micrometer tin film. Oops. They put a glass rod on top of it, you see here. I don't know, why does it stop? In the lab it doesn't stop. <laughs> you see the color changes, the whole surface changes. Eh? It's like waves on the sea. Eh? You see the, all the waves changing, and you see the object spinning. And it goes clockwise. We can spin it clockwise, we can spin it counterclockwise. The motor you don't see because the motor is only one billion of a meter in size and there's only a tiny amount. This was really an Eureka moment in my career. For the first time, after the discoveries of these motors, I saw with my naked eye, I saw this whole surface moving. I saw the color change. I saw the object spinning without touching. Everything autonomous, just by switching on the light. And so, now we have used them to build tiny robots. You see, we make muscles that you can bend, putting these motors in pieces of plastic, and they change, yeah, and we can bend. We have now a piece of plastic that walks over the table when we switch on the light, thanks to these motors. I don't know how much plastic you have in your kitchen or in your student house that starts walking when you switch on the light. But we have now this kind of system, you know, that starts moving under the influence of these molecular motors. And I will show you a small movie how this works, we, because we make these artificial materials that can move, robotic type of systems, etc. Thanks. So we build in these motors, yeah, in, in, in polymer materials, in plastics, and you see they can contract and expand. Of course, they need energy, but that's very simple from the light. You don't have to do anything, just shine. And then they work together. That's called cooperative action, working together, yeah? Like a student team works together, you know, to solve a problem. And you see, they work together. You contract, expand, and then the muscle starts to move. And you can pick up a piece of paper, yeah? Of course, it's all still primitive, but it works, and it's extremely robust, and you don't touch it. So we put also these, these motors into 2D confinement on the surface. And uh, coming from the Netherlands, yeah, you will appreciate that we like windmills. <laughs> so I was challenged with my students to build a tiny windmill. So these, you see, this is a modern windmill. These are the old ones that you can still see, you know, when you come as a tourist. What we did is we put legs, a stator, an axle, and a rotor. We put them, assemble them on different surfaces like gold or, or glass or a metal, and then they can spin. And we built a nano windmill park. So this is one layer of these tiny motors that spin, not under the influence of wind, eh? but in the influence of sunlight, they move, they rotate. 
and they all rotate in the same direction. So this is 20 meters, this is two nanometers, a billion times smaller. Now you might say, okay, all right, nice, funny, what are these kids playing, you know, at your university? But realize, when you make responsive surfaces and coatings, you can make self-cleaning windows. You can make solar panels that clean themselves. Usually in Holland, where I live, it's not a problem because it rains so often that they clean themselves. But when you go to Spain or whatever, you have to clean them often because there's so much dust there. That you lose a lot of efficiency. Cleaning your cars. In the future, I predict that we will have coatings on the cars that clean themselves. Self-repair materials. I know also here in, in your university they work on self-repair materials. If you have dynamic systems, yeah, they can repair themselves. Like you have a scratch in your finger, yeah? If you keep it clean, it repairs itself, eh? But when you have a cut your plastic, eh, or you scratch here something, it doesn't repair itself. We have now a piece of plastic in the lab, we cut it, we put it together, 10 minutes later it's repaired. Simply due to these tiny machines. So this is a bit the future, yeah? Self-repairing, self-cleaning, all these kind of things. It's a long way from fundamental science to innovative development. But I was very pleased, you know, sometimes it's great. It's absolutely fantastic that you get a call from Stockholm. This is the highest honor you can get. But I tell you, this is also great. I was in Berlin, and look here. This is our motor with tri le three legs that we also we just, I just published that. And I saw a graffiti artist used it in his graffiti. <laughs> what an honor a scientist can get, you know. <laughs> So this was the tiny valve. We also put them in 3D confinement, so 3D space. So this is this porous. This is a really hot area in science, in material science, etc. 3D porous materials for membranes, for water purification, for CO2 sequestering, air purification, etc. And we put our motors in there, and we have now crystalline solid materials with millions of these motors, yeah, in these pores, and we can control the porosity of these systems. And that gives us a lot of new technology possibilities. Okay, I think I have a few minutes left, eh? Huh? Five minutes, okay, that's fine. So, now I talked about rotation, but what about translation, you know? How to move forward. And so we build a nano car. So this is our molecular car powered by solar energy. It's a four-wheel drive, as you can see, yeah? It's two nanometers in size and it moves over a surface. It took us a long time, I tell you, to build it, eight years. But at the end, it worked. Here it is. It's two nanometers in size, it's a four-wheel drive, and we go from rotation to translational motion. So we can move over a surface, yeah, as long as we feed it with energy. This is our nano car. And now you might ask, how does such a nano car move? Now, when I move my muscle, you know, there are millions of these motors that make it possible that I can move my muscle, eh? But it's not like a car in the street. It's more like in your muscle. So this is, let me see if this works. This is how it moves. So it steps over the surface, you know? This is how our nano car moves. And you might not believe me, but this is what I borrowed from Harvard. This is, uh, they make an animation, how things are transported in your body. I mean, if you look at, at, at in your body, in your cells, your cell builds the highways, eh? from here to Antwerp, for instance. It builds a highway, and as soon as you have passed by, yeah, it breaks it down and it rebuilds it. You see? It's all done at this moment. Eh? This comes at an enormous speed. Building, assembly, disassembly, and this is how it's transported, things in your cell. Can you imagine? This is why you are alive, eh? This is how they transport things in your cells. So maybe our motors don't look so bad after all. You know? Oh yeah, this is a modern electric car, and I'm sure all of you will own sometimes a modern electric car. This is a Tesla. This is our car. You see, this tiny powder. But there are one billion times one billion identical nano cars in this tiny tube. So I would claim that a car manufacturing plant is not so bad after all. There was also a, f uh, oh yeah, I talked about, yeah, races. This is the first ever molecular car race, 
36 hours live race for nano cars. It wasn't too loose, you see? Formula One for nano cars. Isn't it beautiful? It's all very early days, but it works. So, to finish up with the science part, do we will have the fantastic voyage? Some of the senior people here remember this beautiful book and this movie. Asimov, fantastic voyage, with this tiny robot that came in the body and had to uh, repair something in the brain. I don't know. But what we did is we, we know now how to make motion. And what we did is we built nanotubes with enzymes because we wanted also to do something different than only with light. And we used, we discussed and we thought what would be the fuel. And then my student said, oh, there is plenty of sugar in your, in your body. Can we make movement with the add of sugar? And yes, it worked. Yeah, we use sugar as a fuel. The enzymes convert to sugar. They generate oxygen. And you see it propels like a rocket. It's still very primitive, but it moves, eh? these particles. They move autonomously without any touch. This is far from a robot in your body. But will it be there in the future? Is it science or science fiction? I predict that in 50 years from now, think about your smartphone. 50 years from now, the surgeon here might inject a nano robot in your blood vein that goes to find a tumor or detect, yeah? Or deliver a drug with high precision or maybe do a repair. Yes, it will happen. But I'm not so good in uh, prediction. So I would say the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that is what we as scientists do all the time. That's why we are here at the universities. So I want to conclude with th uh, saying that we started with Mother Nature. We made switches and motors. We make smart drugs, responsive materials, molecular machines, soft robotics. That's a bit of a glimpse towards the future. But first, of course, you have to find the basic principles, the basic science, the knowledge to do that. And uh, yeah, this is why we share this passion with my international team from 13 different countries inventing our future. And this is the most important slide. I own a lot to my young talents, the creativity, the hard work in the lab, also a lot of things that went wrong and that we went on. And yeah, then uh, the question comes up to us, did I know that I would get a call from Stockholm? No. But before I go there, I want to give one message that I learned, you know, to all of you. Discover your talent. Follow your dreams. Be confident. Discover your energy. What is your passion, ladies and gentlemen? And how, discover your limits. How high can you set the bar? Sometimes it's really worthwhile to put the bar a little bit higher, to do something difficult. Yeah? Also during your studies, you know, it gives such a fantastic feeling that you solved a problem, a difficult problem, or you got a step further. So be confident, but most important for the young people here, follow your dreams. That is what I did. And yeah, I didn't know, of course, that I would get this call from Stockholm because you work on your lab with your students. I was teaching, you know, and I was, of course, excited about the discoveries we made. But then I got a call from a colleague in Illinois, in the United States. And he said, Ben, you were last night on American television. I said, come on, you're joking. Yes, yes, look, in The Simpsons, 2011. That was the week before the announcement of the Nobel Prize. And uh, they had a betting pool. You see, Gemistry, Saar, Murner, Feringa, Siona, Kashira. Murner got the Nobel Prize in 2014. I had to wait another two years. The next morning, I came in the lab. And of course, my students had seen this on Twitter, or I don't know, the internet. They kept doing, Professor Ben, you will get the Nobel Prize. Predicted by the Simpsons. <laughs> I said, look, guys. If I am on primetime American television, in The Simpsons, what is the highest honor you can get yeah, <laughs> as a scientist? Now, of course, uh, then the call came, you know, this is like a fairy tale. This is the Swedish king who just handed over the medal to me, you know. And then we have a nice dinner, you see, for 1,200 guests, which is amazing, you know. I was sitting here somewhere next to the prince princess and so. It's absolutely fabulous. It's like a dream, you know, that comes true. And then, and now I want to finish. 
But this is very special because I'm from a small country, Holland. Yeah? And I gave, after the Nobel Prize, I was back in Holland, and I gave this, this uh, the, I spent the whole day with elementary school kids and with high school kids. So we had a whole day outreach for, for students, you know. And then at the end of the day, he said to me, Ben, we want to give you a present, but we were struggling because you have already a medal, you know, you got a nice medal in Stockholm. What should we give him? And so they looked at America, and I got this Nobel Prize together with Sir Fraser Stoddart, who is in Chicago, in Northwestern. And you know, in front of the building there, in their department, there is a reserved parking spot for Sir Fraser Stoddart, 2016 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. Permits, everyone want. This is his limousine. He has two par huge parking spaces in front of the department, you know? That's American style. But I'm in the north of Holland. And then they said, we have a problem <laughs> because Ben never comes by car. He always comes by bike every day to the lab. So now I'm extremely honored because look in our biking shed, that is this plaque, bicycle parking space reserved for Nobel laureates. I'm so pleased with that, you know. So let me finish with my hero, Leonardo da Vinci. He said 500 years ago, when nature finishes producing his own species, man begins with the help of nature to create an infinity of species, inventing our future. And for all the young stars here, all the young talents, imagine the unimaginable. Thank you so much. Thank you.